Good afternoon, everyone. I'll have two announcements at the top, and then uh, happy to take your questions first. The United States has sent a robust interagency delegation to the Our Ocean Conference currently taking place in Panama. The delegation, headed by Special Presidential Envoy for Climate John Kerry, is announcing nearly $6 billion in voluntary commitments at Our Oceans Panama this year, more than double the commitments in 2022. Focused on enabling climate resilience, these voluntary commitments include actions on green shipping and offshore re renewable energy, support for coastal communities, support for maritime protected areas, improving the management of fisheries, increasing efforts to combat illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, combating maritime pollution, including plastic pollution, support for sustainable and inclusive blue economic activities like ocean ecotourism, and improving maritime security. There will be a special media call tomorrow, Friday, March 3rd, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, featuring Special Envoy Kerry and Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, International, Environmental, and Scientific Affairs, Monica Medina. And I would encourage all of you to join the call to learn more about uh, our commitment at the Our Ocean Conference. Next and finally, we congratulate Ambassador Cindy McCain on her, import and on her appointment by the UN Secretary General and the FAO Director General to serve as the next Executive Director of the World Food Program. We are grateful for Ambassador McCain's service as permanent representative to the UN agencies for food and agriculture in Rome, and we are confident she will continue to be a powerful voice in the global fight against hunger. The World Food Program plays a crucial role in the international community's efforts to respond to the worsening global food security crisis. The United States, as its largest contributor, is deeply invested in continuing that success. We also want to express our appreciation and gratitude to outgoing WFP Executive Director David Beasley, for his dedication to the millions around the world in need of life-sustaining support. So with that, happy to take your questions. Please. Ned, um, what are you learning about the pro ongoing protest uh, in Georgia over a draft law um, on so-called flowing agent that the ruling party, uh, Georgian Dream, initiated um, and adopted actually a few hours ago mm. at the first hearing in the parliament of Georgia? Um, so the initiator of this law they are arguing that this is similar to um, U.S. law, F-A-R-A. So, you know, what do you think this leaves the 30 plus years of uh, uh, building democracy in Georgia by the U.S.? Well, this is something that we've spoken to over the past uh, couple days. We've expressed our consistent concern about this. Uh, the law is still going through the uh, process within the Georgian system, but nevertheless, uh, we remain deeply troubled uh, by the uh, introduced foreign agents law. Uh, precisely because it would stigmatize and silence independent voices and citizens of Georgia uh, who are dedicated to building a better country uh, for their fellow citizens, for uh, their communities. Uh, we are deeply concerned about uh, the potential implications of this law for freedom of speech and democracy uh, in Georgia. Uh, our point has been a simple one, and we've made this point uh, in public, but we've also conveyed it in, in private. Uh, anyone voting for this draft legislation uh, would be responsible for potentially jeopardizing Georgia's Euro-Atlantic future. Uh, a law like this is not consistent with the aspirations that the Georgian people have expressed over the course of decades now. Uh, the future they have set out for themselves uh, in the future that we as United States are determined uh, to continue to be a partner uh, to help them achieve. It's not just, just the United States expressing these reservations. Several other partner countries, the EU, the UN, and Georgian civil society groups uh, have also issued strong statements of concern about this uh, draft legislation. Now, there's been uh, a lot of propaganda uh, about this law. Uh, you mentioned uh, one of these uh, untruths, uh, the idea that this law was based on our Foreign Agents uh, Registration Act, or FARA. Uh, our Foreign Agents Registration Act requires people who are agents of foreign governments to register as such. Our law does not affect NGO operations or funding sources. Uh, we can uh, provide you with additional details on FARA if that would be uh, of use. But um, FARA is very narrow. It is tailored uh, to apply only uh, to those agents of foreign governments. This is something very different, uh, and that's why we're, we're quite concerned about it. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and the Russia expert Fiona Hill the other day at the Brookings Institute event mentioned that um, U.S. attention to human rights record of Georgia and freedom of speech, et cetera, was not sufficient. 
Um, how would you respond to that? Because may, for many years, especially in the past few years, Georgian civil society organizations, opposition leaders, and uh, Western-oriented Georgians collectively, we are calling and urging the U.S. to impose sanctions against the oligarchy Vanishvili and his puppets in the government. And there is a growing concern that the state capture and uh, growing authoritarianism and oligarchy is, is just booming in Georgia. So would you agree with uh, Condoleezza Rice and Fiona Hill on that? What I would say, and this has been a project of successive administrations, and that's why I think you are right to point to uh, what Fiona Hill said, what former Secretary of State uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, has said as well. This has been a project of um, the people of Georgia, uh, but also uh, a partnership with the United States of America since Georgia's independence, going on decades now. From the beginning, uh, we have stand, we have stood in solidarity uh, with our Georgian partners, and again, their own aspirations uh, to be a free and sovereign country within its internationally recognized borders. Uh, we, of course, and you're alluding to this, have heard um, damaging rhetoric uh, from some who may be opposed to those uh, Euro-Atlantic aspirations that the Georgian people have put forward. We've spoken to uh, this law as well. Uh, when we have seen that, when we have heard that. We have used our voice publicly. Uh, we've also used our voice privately. Ambassador Degnan and the team in Tbilisi have been deeply engaged uh, doing the work of this partnership uh, with their Georgian counterparts, uh, not only over the course of recent weeks, but uh, over the course of some 30 years now. Because over the course of some 30 years, we have uh, turned this partnership into a strategic one. Uh, it's an important one for us, uh, we wish to continue to work together uh, towards that shared vision of Georgia, fully integrated into the Euro-Atlantic family of nations and part of a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. Now, obviously, there are many challenges to that, uh, some within Georgia, uh, some on the periphery uh, of Georgia's border. Uh, but this is a vision that we know will take political will. It will take hard work. It will take resources uh, to help realize the United States is ready to continue uh, to be a partner, and we hope to continue uh, to find partners uh, in the Georgian government. Uh, you mentioned those who are going to vote for this vote, the resolution will be responsible. Can you be a little bit more precise, uh, particularly when it comes to talk about the elephant in the room? My colleague mentioned Mr. Ivanishvili. Will the United States government be willing to actually uh, go after Ivan Shvili and his party if they succeed in, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sucking the oxygen from uh, Georgia's democracy. Alex, our focus right now is making very clear where the United States stands. Uh, we want there to be no doubt about the concerns that we've expressed, the concerns that the EU's expressed, the UN has expressed, a number of countries around the world have expressed, and probably most importantly of all, uh, the concerns that the Georgian government should be hearing uh, from civil society within their own country, from uh, their own citizens. Uh, that's our focus. Uh, of course, this passage of this law, implementation of this law, would be a uh, great concern for us. We're not going to, to cross that bridge at this stage. Uh, it remains draft legislation that's under discussion by Georgian lawmakers. That's why we think at this stage the most important thing we can do uh, is to leave no doubt uh, about where we and the international community stands on this. Region, uh, I know I've asked this before, but it, yesterday was the you know, uh, first month of a uh, new Caucasus negotiator mm -hmm. who was just appointed uh, to region. Um, is it fair for us to expect uh, his first trip anytime soon to region? You can expect that, in fact. Uh, the senior advisor for caucus negotiations, uh, Louis Bono, is traveling to the region next week uh, on his first trip uh, in this role. Uh, this is the first of what we, will, what we expect will be uh, regular travel to all three uh, countries of the South Caucasus. Uh, Mr. Bono plans to meet with senior leaders to support the Armenia-Azerbaijan peace process and our sustained commitment to Georgia's sovereignty uh, and territorial integrity. Uh, as I mentioned before, he will visit all three South Caucasus countries as part of his visit. He'll travel to Baku, to Yerevan, uh, to Tbilisi as well in that order. Uh, this, we believe, will be an opportunity for Mr. Bono to build on the meeting between Secretary Blinken, 
Armenia's prime minister and Azerbaijan's uh, president uh, at the Munich Security Conference a couple weeks ago now uh, in mid-February. We, as we said at the conclusion of that trilateral engagement, we are encouraged uh, by recent efforts by Armenia and Azerbaijan to engage productively on the peace process, and Mr. Bono helps to, hopes to be in a position uh, to build uh, on that effort and to see that progress continue. Uh, in all three of these cities, Mr. Bono will emphasize the United States is committed to promoting a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous future uh, for the South Caucasus region. Jenny. I had a couple of questions on the Secretary's meeting with Lavrov this sure. morning, Ned. Um, what caused the Secretary to want to reach out to Lavrov at this point in time? Was there some development that led him to believe this would be a productive conversation? And the serious proposal he raised on Paul Whelan, how long has that been on the table? What can you tell us about it? And have the Russians engaged at all on it? Sure. A couple things, uh, Jenny, and you heard the Secretary uh, speak to this. First, uh, what this was not, as opposed to, to what it was. Uh, you heard from the Secretary this was a rather brief encounter with Foreign Minister Lavrov. This was not uh, a bilateral meeting. This was not uh, a protracted discussion between the two. Uh, this was a rather brief encounter uh, that the Secretary took advantage of to convey clearly and directly uh, messages that are important to the United States and, uh, in many cases, to the rest of the world. Uh, the Secretary uh, outlined those three messages. Uh, his first was on New START. And again, uh, we've spoken extensively to this since uh, the Russian Federation suspended its implementation of the New START Treaty because it's not only a concern for the United States as a responsible nuclear power, uh, but it should be and in fact is a concern for the rest of the world as the rest of the world expects Russia and the United States just as we did with the Soviet Union during the course of the Cold War, uh, to cooperate uh, and to engage in talks on strategic stability and arms control. Uh, second, you mentioned this, but the Secretary did raise, uh, as he consistently has, uh, the uh, continued wrongful detention of U.S. citizen uh, Paul Whelan. Uh, he noted that we had put a proposal on the table. He, again, uh, encouraged uh, Russia to accept it. Uh, and third, uh, he underscored our continued uh, commitment to Ukraine, including uh, the proposals that we've heard from President Zelensky and his government for uh, a just and durable peace, a peace that respects the UN Charter, as well as the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, he stressed that Ukraine and the United States want this war to end. We want this war to end on that basis. No one wants this war to end more than Ukraine. We are standing uh, right by Ukraine in our desire to see this war come to a, to a close. And we are continuing uh, to be ready to support uh, that effort. But uh, what continues to be missing uh, is a similar determination uh, from Moscow. The Secretary is not going to hesitate to convey clearly and directly messages that are important to us and that are important to the rest of the world. Uh, of course, the continued detention of Paul Whelan is a concern to us. He's an American citizen. The practice of wrongful detention uh, is a concern to the rest of the world. It is a concern to the rest of the world that Russia has uh, purportedly suspended its implementation of the New START Treaty. It's a concern to the rest of the world that Russia is waging a brutal, illegal war of aggression against Ukraine. And as we've heard from most of the G20, in fact, all except uh, Russia, and China, the G20 wants to see this war come to an end uh, on a basis that's consistent with the new UN Charter uh, and on a basis that is both just and durable. So the Secretary had an opportunity to convey these messages directly uh, to Lavrov, and we thought it was important to do so. On the proposal for uh, Paul Whelan, this is something that uh, in all of our key engagements with Russian interlocutors, we raise, and we impress upon them uh, the need to see the release of Paul Whelan. He has been held for far too long, wrongfully detained. He uh, should never have been uh, held in the first place. We have, as we said before, been relentless in our efforts to secure his release, just as we were relentless in our efforts to secure the release of Trevor Reed and Brittany Griner uh, over the course of the past year. The proposal that the Secretary alluded to, this was uh, not a proposal that the Russians heard for the first time today. This was a proposal that we have conveyed to them uh, consistently in the past. What he did 
here today was once again uh, a strong statement from the Secretary of State that Russia should accept this proposal and in turn it should release Paul Whelan. Can you say have the Russians engaged meaningfully with that proposal at all? Have they acknowledged it? We have we have two uh, overriding imperatives. Number one uh, is to see the release of uh, Paul Whelan uh, and to see more broadly the release of Americans who are wrongfully detained anywhere around the world. Uh, in the conduct of uh, seeking that first imperative, uh, we're not going to do or say anything that could jeopardize those efforts. So you can understand why uh, we're going to continue to be circumspect in what we say publicly uh, about this. But uh, we have conveyed uh, in some detail and all of the necessary detail to the Russian Federation the proposal that uh, we have put on the table. We have gone about this relentlessly. We have gone about this creatively, uh, seeking uh, to do everything we can uh, to see the release uh, of Paul Whelan and beyond Paul, uh, Americans who are wrongfully detained anywhere uh, around the world. Nick, can I just follow up on sure. that? Uh, the Secretary has said that he, the day before he did not have any plans to meet the to meet Lavrov. I was just wondering, um, did the meeting happen at the request of the United States or at the request of the Russians? I know our Russian colleagues are attempting to make some hay uh, out of this. What is important for us to convey is that this was a brief encounter. Uh, this was not uh, a protracted uh, bilateral meeting or, or a protracted sit down between the two of them. Uh, but more broadly, uh, we make no apologies for clearly conveying what is in our interest. It is in our interest to see Russia resume implementation, full implementation of the New START Treaty. It's in uh, the interest of the rest of the world to see that as well. It's in our interest to see Paul Whelan return home uh, just as soon as can be accomplished. And it's certainly in the interest of Ukraine, of the United States, of all of the countries around the world who believe in the UN Charter to see the war in Ukraine, Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, come to an end on a basis that is both just and durable. Uh, the Russians may be trying to make some hay and to uh, delve into some inside baseball or inside diplomacy. Um, we are just not going to engage in that. Uh, what we want to make clear is precisely what the Secretary said, why he said it, uh, and we make no apologies for that. Rather, uh, we will continue to be relentless uh, in raising these issues uh, at every appropriate opportunity. Uh, let, me, let me move around. Yes, go ahead, Julia. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Peter Welch, who just got back from Makodel to Israel, delivered a letter to President Biden today urging him to take action to help improve relations amid the violence in the West Bank. In the letter, he said, as far as the Netanyahu government is concerned, the two-state solution is dead and is calling on the U.S. to acknowledge that and is calling Biden to take a more active role in the region, um, saying we have a choice, stand by passively as a withered two-state approach recedes into oblivion or do our best to re-energize it with more assertive efforts to persuade the Netanyahu government. What is your response to this letter? Do you think that the posture should change amid the tension in the, the West Bank? Um, do you think the Biden should be taking a more proactive approach? A couple things on this. Uh, number one, uh, we continue to believe deeply, as do Israelis and Palestinians uh, and people around the world, in a vision of a two-state solution, a negotiated two-state solution, a vision of two states for two peoples living side by side in peace and security. Uh, that is the vision that the United States has maintained over successive administrations. It is the vision that is consistent with Israel's identity as a uh, Jewish and democratic state. It is a vision that is consistent with the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people uh, to live in uh, freedom in a state of their own uh, and a state that is governed uh, by their elected uh, officials. Uh, there's no other formulation that we could envision uh, accomplishing uh, all of those goals. And all of those goals are important to us, but more importantly, they're important to Israelis uh, and Palestinians. Now, on the question of engagement, uh, I would note that we're hearing this uh, within some uh, 72 hours or so of senior American officials being on the ground with Israelis, with Palestinians, with Jordanians, with Egyptians. Uh, we're hearing this a couple weeks after the Secretary of State 
uh, was in Israel, was in the West Bank, was in Cairo. Uh, we're hearing this a few weeks, a month or so, after the National Security Advisor uh, was in Israel and the West Bank. We are deeply engaged in the region. We are uh, deeply engaged with uh, the parties. Uh, we have consistently made the point that the steps that the parties need to take to de-escalate tensions and to ensure that calm prevails, these are not steps that the United States can take. These are not steps that countries in the region uh, can take, but these are steps that the parties themselves will have to take. But at the same time, these are steps themselves that we will continue to partner with the parties, with Israelis, with Palestinians, uh, as we hope, as we expect, uh, they continue to take them uh, as they committed to one another in Aqaba and the meeting in Jordan I alluded to uh, just a moment ago. So would your response to this call to take a more proactive role in the region be that you believe the Biden administration is being proactive enough? Is there anything else that you know, you could be or plan to be doing? We are, we are engaged uh, in the region broadly. We are engaged uh, in this issue in, in particular. Uh, throughout the course of this administration, uh, we have taken an approach that uh, may not always be showy. It may not always be flashy. It may not always publicly put the United States uh, at the forefront of, of efforts, but uh, it is consistently proven to be effective. Uh, it's the approach we took to help uh, Israelis and Palestinians uh, bring an end to uh, the conflict in the spring and summer of 2021. Uh, it's an approach that we took last year as tension soared uh, in the West Bank between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, it's the approach that we're taking now with the American officials sitting down, actively engaging as participants uh, in this uh, five-way meeting in Aqaba, Jordan, that involved Israelis, Palestinians, Egyptians, Jordanians, and yes, uh, Americans. It's the approach we've taken in the Negev Forum, uh, meeting with uh, our Israeli partners, meeting with uh, those countries that have normalized relations with Israel, as we encourage the parties to bring the Palestinians uh, into the fold uh, and to encourage progress, just as we encourage progress on normalization uh, with Israel's neighbors near and far to encourage progress on the Palestinian question uh, as well. So I think however you uh, look at our approach, you see an America that is engaged, uh, you see an America that is a partner to the parties, uh, and you see an approach that has, has proven to be effective. Yes. Uh, uh, sure, Israel, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, can you give us anything today about the trip of the Israeli delegation coming to Washington next week? Uh, I, I, we would refer you, as we always would, to our uh, Israeli partners uh, for any comment on uh, travel plans. Uh, as for us, uh, we've spoken to the concern we have uh, about ongoing violence in the region. Uh, we've urged Israel and the Palestinian Authority to protect against the further uh, loss of life. Uh, we've made our, our views very clear on this. I don't have any travel uh, to announce, nor would we announce travel uh, for, uh, for a foreign partner. Well, Axios is reporting that the main reason for their trip is Iran and that they're even um, intending to meet with Secretary Blinken and also that uh, Israel's domestic uh, issues as well as uh, its performance in the West Bank is, is a precondition to how the uh, Biden administration may work with the Netanyahu government on Iran. Uh, a couple things on that. First, uh, we engage regularly with our Israeli partners. Uh, I ran through some of the high-level visits uh, that uh, you've been witness to, Gita, from the National Security Advisor to the Secretary of State, to our Assistant Secretary of State, to the White House Coordinator for uh, the region. There have been many other visits and engagements uh, on top of that. We have traveled to the region. Our Israeli partners have traveled here. Uh, I expect that will continue in the coming days, weeks, uh, in months, but we just don't have any travel to uh, uh, to preview at the moment. Yes. Um, not sure if this is the same, tr actually two questions. First one, not sure if this is the same trip my colleague is referring to, but um, the finance minister, uh, Smutrich, is reportedly planning to be um, in the U.S. I think next week for um, an investment conference of some sort. Um, would the U.S., based on his sort of recent comments, consider revoking his visa, which is something that some groups here have been urging. Um, and then sort of on a related question to something that was discussed earlier, um, 
there was a bill introduced earlier this week on the Hill to um, create an ambassador level special envoy position for the Abraham Accords. Is that something the State Department is supportive of, thinks would be necessary, helpful? So a, a couple of things. Um, first, on uh, potential travel here, we don't speak to individual visa records, nor as a general matter to uh, a particular individual's eligibility for uh, a U.S. visa. Uh, nevertheless, we'll continue to make clear that we reject the comments from the minister, um, just as we did yesterday, uh, and we appreciate and the condemnations that we've heard from our Israeli partners. On uh, the legislation you refer to, uh, this is a project building bridges between Israel's uh, Arab and Muslim majority neighbors, both near and far, that this administration has uh, been a stalwart supporter of. Uh, we celebrated uh, a notable anniversary of the Abraham Accords and the normalization uh, agreements here in this building uh, last year. Uh, in our engagements with uh, Arab and Muslim majority countries uh, around the world, uh, we consistently raise uh, the possibility of improving relationships with Israel and improving relations with Israel, and in some cases, uh, encouraging countries to um, pursue uh, that path of normalization, something that uh, we unambiguously uh, support. This has high level attention uh, in this building, it has high level attention in the White House. We're going to continue to do uh, what we can as a partner to Israel, as a partner to uh, these Arab and Muslim majority countries. Uh, and uh, we're going to take a close look at, at all proposals, and if something makes sense, if something would allow us to be even more effective uh, in that project, uh, we wouldn't hesitate to pursue it. Uh, yes, Leon, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question on uh, Tunisia. Sure. We don't talk about it so, so much. Uh, the situation is deteriorating there. Um, I would like to have your assessment on that situation right now in Tunisia. Uh, I understand there was a call also by the Brett McKirk uh, this morning, um, but there's no reference to the uh, arrests or demonstrations uh, that are happening there in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, there's apparently been contacts between U.S. Embassy and opposition activists there, and the Tunisian Foreign Ministry gave a pretty strong rebuke saying, not to interfere in uh, internal affairs. Uh, can you confirm those contacts and can you comment on, on that statement? So first to your broader question, uh, Leon, we've spoken of our concerns uh, to what uh, has been happening in Tunisia in recent months. Uh, we spoke to it last month, I believe. We expressed our uh, concern by the reported arrests of multiple political figures, business leaders, and, and journalists. Um, we've expressed that concern precisely because uh, we in the world uh, have uh, seen over the course of years now the aspirations of the Tunisian people for uh, greater levels of democracy, uh, for uh, an independent and transparent judiciary, uh, and one that is able to protect uh, fundamental freedoms for all the people of Tunisia. Uh, we've engaged uh, with the Tunisian government at all levels in support of human rights and freedom of expression. Uh, these are not values that we support only in a place like Tunisia, but these are universal rights uh, that we seek to defend and to promote uh, anywhere and everywhere uh, around the world. Uh, now, there have been uh, allegations in, in recent days that, that you alluded to, and uh, I can say that we are alarmed by reports of criminal charges against individuals in Tunisia resulting from meetings or conversations uh, with U.S. Embassy uh, staff on the ground. Uh, this is part, as I said before, of an escalating pattern of arrests against perceived critics of uh, the government. This is what our embassies and our diplomats do around the world. A primary role for any U.S. Embassy or any diplomat anywhere in the world is to meet with a wide array of individuals to inform our understanding uh, of the different views and perspectives uh, in that country. Uh, this is their primary task, to help inform policymakers uh, back in the United States uh, so that we can best uh, support uh, our partners in government and support uh, our partners uh, in the people of any given country, including the aspirations uh, they have. Uh, 
Uh, Tunisian and other foreign diplomats posted to the United States uh, regularly engage in similar meetings. This is the work of diplomacy. It is the bread and butter uh, of our diplomats. It is the bread and butter of uh, diplomats from countries uh, around the world. And it is a practice that uh, should not be subject uh, to persecution of any sort. So yes. you, you confirm those contacts, but, but can you confirm with whom? Uh in what context uh, they, they were they we, done? We, we've seen reports of, of criminal charges uh, against individuals in Tunisia purportedly stemming from their contacts uh, with U.S. diplomats. Um, but again, uh, the fact that our diplomats are meeting with Tunisians, uh, we are doing that so that this government can best support the Tunisian government, but can also best support the Tunisian people uh, and their aspirations. Uh, this is not any different from the kind of work that we do anywhere uh, around the world. Uh, it is the kind of work that our Tunisian counterparts do right here in Washington, uh, as the Tunisian government also wants to understand what is happening in, in this country. Uh, it is what every, just about every foreign embassy does in the United States. It is what every single one of our embassies uh, do around the world. Yes. Two questions. Going back to India, uh, as far as secretaries uh, stay there, visit and meeting many foreign ministers, and including the Indian foreign minister Jay Shankar. My question is that now, in the next coming weeks and months, India chairing the G20 will be the global stage for many global leaders, or especially for the G20. Question is here that uh, and does secretary believe that India still have the uh, not power, but uh, uh, to break the ice as far as to stop the or end the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine or Russia's uh, war against Ukraine. And uh, while in India meeting the uh, Indian officials, you think they discuss this, that India still can play a role? Uh, so uh, a couple things, Goyal. First, uh, and you heard this from the secretary, we're deeply grateful. Uh, to our Indian partners for uh, the way they have led uh, the G20 to date. And as you alluded to, there is a lot more work to be done over the course uh, of this year, um, but India is off to a, a very promising start uh, with its stewardship of the G20. Our partnership, and this is, uh, was, a, was a subject of discussion between Secretary Blinken and uh, his uh, counterpart, Foreign Secretary Jashankar, uh, earlier today, uh, our partnership with India is, is one of the most consequential relationships uh, we have. Um, and that's because we work closely with India on just about everything that is a priority to us and everything that is a priority uh, to India, increasing our mutual prosperity, supporting democracy, addressing the climate crisis, upholding uh, a rules-based order grounded in international law. Uh, and is that point, the rules-based order that is so important to us around the world, but particularly important to the United States and to India uh, in the context of the Indo-Pacific. It is helping to build and to preserve a free and open Indo-Pacific region, uh, a vision that we share with uh, our Indian uh, counterparts. Uh, the Secretary and his counterpart had an opportunity to talk about the tremendous work India has done uh, so far in hosting the G20 foreign ministers and hosting the finance ministers uh, as well and creating an agenda uh, really that allows us to tackle the key issues uh, that are uh, so important in our uh, global strategic partnership uh, with India in all of its breadth and in all of its uh, depth. Uh, the G20 is an important instrument for us. It's an important instrument uh, for India. We, we've seen how the G20 uh, can bring together countries for uh, collective action. Uh, we think what we've seen in India over the past couple days was uh, no exception. And the United States, for our part, uh, participated in this foreign minister's meeting with uh, two imperatives in mind. First, to see to it uh, that the G20, again, with India uh, at the helm, uh, was a success, uh, which uh, clearly... Uh, it, it was. And second, uh, to demonstrate how the United States, together with our partners, uh, is working collaboratively uh, to build a world uh, that is more prosperous, is more sustainable, it is uh, uh, more uh, inclusive in terms of the global economy, and that delivers uh, for the needs of people around the world, whether that's food, whether that's energy, uh, whether that is health, whether that is uh, helping people around the world confront uh, the challenges and threats that they face from fentanyl and narcotics 
uh, to a changing climate, uh, to COVID, uh, and to everything in, in between. Now, on the question of, of India, uh, there are countries around the world uh, that have uh, a relationship with Russia that is distinct from the one we have. Uh, India certainly falls within that category. Uh, India has longstanding uh, historical ties to Russia. Uh, it is connected in Russia uh, to ways that uh, the United States is not, and for that matter, uh, has not been. Uh, India also has tremendous uh, leverage in different areas, whether it's economic leverage, diplomatic leverage, political leverage, but also uh, moral leverage. And India has the ability, as we've seen from Prime Minister Modi, to speak with tremendous moral clarity. Uh, when Prime Minister Modi said last year that this is not an era uh, of war, uh, the world listened, uh, as they should, uh, because when Prime Minister Modi uh, and um, his country says something uh, to that effect, it is meaningful to the United States, it's meaningful to Russia, it is meaningful uh, to countries near and far. So we will continue uh, to work with our Indian partners. Uh, they, of course, have a, a unique role to play in this as the G20 hosts, uh, but also uh, as a country with whom we have a global strategic partnership, a country that has a relationship with Russia uh, that we don't. And just as India has consistently expressed that this is not, should not be an era of war, uh, we hope that we can work closely uh, with India to bring about an end to this war, an end to this Russian aggression that is at its core just and durable uh, and very much in line with uh, the principles of uh, the UN Charter. I think you see that uh, reflected in the chair summary that emanated from the G20 meeting uh, earlier today. Of course, this was the chair summary that was uh, subscribed to by all 20 members of the G20 except for uh, two key paragraphs, and we all know uh, those two countries in, que in question, uh, Russia and China. We all know the issue uh, in, question, in question, Russia's brutal war of aggression uh, against Ukraine. But uh, when it comes to uh, the broader set of issues that neither Russia nor China uh, could uh, agree to accept, uh, I think it was pretty notable uh, that the key paragraph uh, referenced uh, the essential need to uphold international law and the multilateral system that safeguards peace and stability. Uh, it is a paragraph that speaks to uh, defending, protecting the principles of uh, the UN Charter, uh, ensuring that countries around the world adhere to international humanitarian law, including the protection of uh, civilians and infrastructure and armed conflict, uh, and uh, that makes clear where countries stand in strongly condemning uh, the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons uh, in any conflict. Uh, the fact that neither Russia nor China uh, could sign on to a paragraph that should be as anodyne and common sense and basic as that, uh, it tells you a lot about two countries that purport to believe in the UN Charter, uh, have been uh, permanent members of uh, the UN Security Council, uh, consistently raise uh, international law uh, and the principles uh, of the UN Charter, only to ignore them in contexts like this. Yes, go ahead. Another question, and I thank you, sir. Uh, because of growing uh, relations between India and US, and also India's rise, uh, neighboring countries, including China and Pakistan, of course, not, are not very happy. And they are trying their best to uh, curtail back or whatever they can do. Uh, now. As far as Pakistan is concerned, there are some elements of Khalistani elements in Pakistan, and they are attacking the Hindu temples there, and also in Australia now, according to reports, press reports, Australia, UK, Canada. Now, as far as Canada is concerned, this Khalistani uh, movement or elements, they are the same group which, uh, in 1985, they uh, brought down the Air India air flight, uh, killing 389 people. Uh, from Canada to uh, going back to India over Canadian part. My question is now here, those elements have threatened the Indian temples here in the U.S., and they are now having the cells here in the U.S. with the support of those same elements. Is the uh, U.S. government aware of that? And because the Indian community or Hindu community here very much uh, 
now meeting uh, so many um, the officials here that because they are threatened or their temples are threatened here by the terrorist or colleagues on the movements. Goyal, without weighing in on the specifics, I can tell you that we condemn any form of violence. We condemn the threat of violence, any form uh, of violent uh, extremism. Uh, this is a country that uh, has always had at its core key values. One of those uh, is religious pluralism, tolerance uh, for people of all faiths or no faith. Uh, that is a principle that uh, we uphold, uh, we respect, uh, and we condemn uh, any individual or, or movement uh, that um, seeks to carry out uh, and enact a different vision. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, sir. And sir, Jahazeh Malik from Airway News. Uh, I have different topic, but just one question came into my mind. Uh, as you talk about uh, Secretary Blinken meeting with his Russian counterpart, you told me like a couple of days ago that whenever American diplomats meet with uh, Russian diplomats, they just discuss bilateral issues, don't discuss Ukraine. Same thing was confirmed by the Russian diplomats and ambassador. I met them a few days ago. So this is the first meeting of Secretary Blinken with the, with the Russian foreign minister after the war began. So is U.S. trying to negotiate, mediate, or just asking a simple question to stop the war and further negotiation or further talks can be followed? Uh, the Secretary's meeting was, uh, he conveyed a very simple uh, message on that. Uh, it is the vision uh, that President Zelensky has put forward for uh, a just and durable peace. We've been very clear from the outset that uh, we are never going to discuss anything about Ukraine without Ukraine. Uh, this was not that and not that at all. In fact, uh, the secretary uh, referenced uh, the very plan that President Zelensky and his administration uh, have put forward, uh, a plan that would be just, that would be durable, that would be lasting uh, in its outlook, and that would respect uh, and adhere to the core principles of the UN Charter, including sovereignty and territorial uh, integrity. Uh, the secretary and we thought it was important that uh, the Russians hear directly from us at that level uh, that we are uh, continuing to stand by Ukraine, continuing to uh, in turn stand by uh, the UN Charter. Uh, but of course, Ukraine wants this war to end. They have put forward uh, a proposal. We are ready working uh, with Ukraine and countries around the world that want to see the UN Charter upheld uh, to support the to support bringing this brutal war of aggression uh, to a conclusion on a basis that is both just and durable. So there is an uh, internet advocacy watchdog uh, access now. They said in, in their latest report that India topped the list of fifth successive year for highest number of internet shutdowns in the world in 2022. Uh, more than 85 sh internet shutdowns uh, were recorded in Indian occupied Kashmir. So your thoughts on that? You always talk about the freedom of speech. You're right. We, we always uh, do talk about it. We talk about uh, freedom of expression, freedom of people around the world to uh, access information. And we continue to highlight the importance of uh, freedom of expression, including uh, via access to the internet as a human right uh, that contributes to strengthening democracies and to strengthening countries uh, around the world. This is something we advocate for uh, with our partners and allies and, and countries uh, around the world. So there is a crackdown on Afghan refugees in Pakistan. Uh, Afghans, including women and children, are being arrested for their illegal presence. They crossed the border after ta Taliban uh, took the power in Afghanistan. So is there any discussion with the Pakistani authorities to give them like uh, temporary shelter till the situation is better in Afghanistan? Uh, this is a matter we're discussing with our Pakistani counterparts. We're in regular discussion uh, with our Pakistani counterparts about this. We encourage all states to uphold their respective obligations uh, with regard to Afghan refugees or asylum seekers uh, and to refrain from returning them uh, to uh, anywhere where they could face persecution or torture. One last question, please. So, sir, a Pakistani court issued arrest warrants for uh, former Prime Minister Imran Khan for selling state gifts and concealing the, his assets. Uh, his party workers termed it a political victimization. So what are your thoughts on like rising political unrest and chaos in Pakistan? These are, these are questions for the Pakistani people. These are not questions for the United States. As I've said before, uh, we support the peaceful upholding of democratic, constitutional, and legal principles uh, around the world, including in, in Pakistan. Michelle. Uh, uh, two questions. One uh, on the meeting uh, between Secretary Blinken mm -hmm. and Saudi Foreign Minister in uh, New Delhi. 
this is the first meeting after a while uh, between uh, US and Saudi officials. How was the meeting and did you open a new page with uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, this was uh, a discussion with uh, between Secretary Blinken and his Saudi counterpart. Uh, it was uh, important for us to uh, welcome, uh, as uh, we have over the course of several days now, uh, the important contributions that our Saudi partners have offered uh, to our shared partners in, in Ukraine. Uh, of course, uh, the Saudi government announced $400 million in humanitarian support. Uh, there was an important visit uh, by uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to uh, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, that's something that we've welcomed. Uh, it was an opportunity for uh, Secretary Blinken and um, Foreign Minister uh, Faisal bin Farhan uh, to discuss uh, these issues and to discuss uh, our partnership, the partnership between our two countries. Uh, and uh, is the US satisfied with the distribution of aid uh, in Syria? There, of course, is, is a tremendous amount of work to be done. Uh, there are going to be needs going forward for months and years to come. It is incumbent, we think, on countries around the world uh, to contribute uh, to this effort. The United States has attempted to lead by example. When Secretary Blinken was in Turkey uh, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, he announced the contribution of $100 million additional uh, U.S. dollars in funding to the people of Syria, to our Turkish allies uh, as well. Uh, the United States has to date contributed uh, $185 million. This is funding that has translated uh, into support for tens of thousands of people across both Turkey and into Syria. Uh, shelter, food, water, uh, help with recovery, uh, rebuilding. This is going to be a long-term project. The United States is going to remain committed to this, uh, and we continue to call on countries around the world uh, to uh, show that they too are committed both in word and in deed, uh, including by uh, announcing generous funding for uh, the people of both Turkey and Syria. Uh, yes, go ahead. Kind of a uh, follow-up on the, the Lavrov uh, encounter. Are there any plans for further follow-up from that conversation? Did that set anything in motion uh, for any sort of more formal dialogue uh, on any of the specific topics or in, that were raised or just in general? Uh, we're not expecting any more formal senior level dialogue uh, in the near term. Of course, we're always uh, going to remain open to dialogue. We believe uh, in dialogue. We believe in diplomacy, especially uh, even when times are tense, especially uh, when uh, the state of our relationship is as it is now and as the Russians are uh, perpetrating uh, what they're doing uh, against Ukraine. Uh, there are issues that are of profound importance uh, to the United States, but also issues that are of profound importance to uh, the rest of the world. But uh, there was no agreement uh, or consensus coming out uh, of that brief encounter uh, for any sort of follow-up discussion, but we're always going uh, to take advantage of opportunities to convey our interests uh, in manners that are clear and, and direct uh, whenever we can. One more along the line on G20. You said, you know, that Blinken would not hesitate to convey the interests. Um, why not have a similar type of conversation with his Chinese counterpart, given there are a lot of issues <laughs> of concern there, to our knowledge. There was no meeting or discussion between those two leaders, so why not um, have a similar conversation with his Chinese counterpart? Principally because the Secretary sat down with uh, the PRC's top foreign policy official just a couple weeks ago in Munich. Uh, they had uh, a more extended discussion uh, on the current state uh, of the bilateral relationship, uh, covering uh, a broad range of topics, as we've discussed. Uh, I expect there will be additional calls and engagements uh, in the coming weeks, uh, but we had just uh, taken advantage of one opportunity a couple weeks ago. Yes, Alex. A few follow-ups on uh, Lavrov uh, and engagement. And my apologies for beating the dead horse, but a few questions need to be cleared up. Uh, starting from Leon's question, uh, who reached out to whom in the past 24 hours? Did the secretary reach out to the Russian side or did the Russian reach out to you? Can you clarify that question? Uh, Alex, we're just not going to go into the inside baseball uh, dynamics of this. Uh, what's important is that uh, the secretary conveyed clearly, directly, in a brief encounter, uh, what is of tremendous interest to us, but also what's of interest to the rest of the world.
Your secretary have a chance to reach out to his Ukrainian counterpart is it before or after this engagement? We've we consulted uh, with partners and allies as we always do uh, ahead of uh, conversations uh, like this. I wouldn't want to characterize those conversations, but uh, we believe in diplomacy. Uh, we believe in uh, diplomacy with uh, countries where we have a relationship that is uh, quite strained, uh, even adversarial, uh, with Russia, but uh, we're in constant dialogue uh, with our allies and partners uh, in Europe and around the world on these issues. Yeah, but this is a clear departure from uh, you know, your strategy from last year, this time, at this very forum. Not only Secretary did not want to engage with him, he didn't even want, want to be in the same forum with him, no handshake. What changed? Uh, Alex, if I recall, the foreign minister's meeting was in July of last year. Secretary Blinken picked up the phone uh, to Foreign Minister uh, Lavrov uh, around that time last year as well. Uh, nothing has changed in the sense that we're always going to uh, convey very clearly. So there can be um, no misconception, no misperception, uh, no confusion uh, about our interests, uh, about uh, things that are of great importance to us and things that are of great importance to the rest of the world. That's what we've consistently done. We've done that at lower levels, uh, and we've done that uh, at the level of Secretary Blinken when it's been appropriate. So he's talking to Lavrov, meaning with him, a new normal. So uh, what is the Secretary's level of trust in him? Given, the, given everything he has done, he lied about the war to the Secretary at his face. He has spent his entire year to you know, uh, talk about you know, his so-called operation. Um, so, is it new normal? Uh, Alex, this was an eight-minute, uh, rather brief encounter. Uh, I don't think anything was said or conveyed uh, in eight minutes that could uh, change the perception that has developed over the course uh, of the past 16 months. Yes, well, last, last question on this. Uh, uh, Secretary said that he told Lavrov to engage in meaningful diplomacy that can produce a just and durable peace in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So clearly he was talking about Ukraine without Ukraine in room. <laughs> You're taking that quite literally. Uh, they were talking about the uh, proposal that President Zelensky himself has put forward, uh, a 10-point proposal uh, that calls for uh, precisely what countries around the world have called for, what we have called for, a just and durable peace. Uh, it is, uh, we think, incumbent on the United States, on us, uh, to do everything we can to help bring about the vision that President Zelensky himself uh, has set out. Uh, and uh, look, we're under no illusions that uh, a very brief encounter like the one Secretary Blinken had uh, with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, will, uh, in the near term or immediately, uh, change Russia's attitude, change its uh, behavior. Uh, but we think it's important for the Russian Federation to hear from us at all levels that we believe in the vision that President Zelensky has set out. We believe in the principles of the UN Charter. Uh, and together with our partners around the world, including Ukraine, of course, uh, we are going to do everything uh, that we can to support that outcome. Yes. Talking about G20 encounters, mm -hmm. I, as you were coming into the briefing room, I saw a tweet from the Secretary's account. Uh, showing that he met a uh, foreign secretary abroad, uh, a Mexican foreign secretary. Do you have any readout of that conversation? How long it, uh, it went and what topics exactly were discussed beyond what the tweet says? Uh, beyond the tweet, uh, I, I don't know that we're in a position to issue a more formal readout, but uh, the secretary and uh, foreign secretary abroad were both uh, in uh, the G20 together. Of course, we have uh, a very important, broad, deep relationship uh, with Mexico. Uh, it is a relationship uh, that uh, uh, on which we engage regularly, uh, including at the senior most levels. Um, but beyond that, um, the tweet stresses that uh, Secretary Blinken uh, presented the topic of a strong dream democracy as relevant in the discussion between both countries. Can you expand on that? Uh, again, I um, uh, wouldn't want to go beyond what the what the brief readout we issued uh, says. If we have any more details to, to uh, convey. It? How long was the... If, if we have any more details to convey, we'll, we'll let you know. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone.